There's a number of categories of Pokemon, from starters to mythicals to Ultra Beasts to legendaries. Some people are cringing right now because they want to comment real bad about how all of the last three are technically legendaries. Go for it, the comments are right there. But regardless of the category a Pokemon occupies, there are always going to be some real stinkers. This video wasn't easy to write, don't get me wrong, I really like some of these Pokemon, but we all gotta face reality sometimes and rip off the bandage. Our favorites aren't always that great. So let's discuss these legendaries that fail to live up to their name in this video. If you enjoyed this at any point in time, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I don't point this out much because I know a lot of you guys hate it, but only like half of my viewers are actually subscribed, so maybe double check for me? Thanks. Let's begin with Raikou, not because it's a good jumping off point, but because a lot of people are pretty into this dude and we gotta rip off the bandage like I said. So while the other two Gen 2 legendary beasts are actually fairly viable, Raikou remains notably weak among them. They all gained a massive buff in Generation 8 by gaining access to their hidden abilities of Inner Focus, but where this makes Entei an unflinchable, unintimidatable physical attacker, and Suicune one of the most reliable Tailwind setters in the game, Raikou is notably lacking in any real impactful options turn 1. It had its moment in Generation 8 as a Pokemon that could set up dual screens and maybe howl to boost the partner's attack, but practically everything it could do was done better by another Pokemon. If you wanted screens up, Grimmsnarl was right there and it could get both of them up much more reliably with its prankster ability, and Regieleki was a far better option for speed control. Regieleki was also just a faster and harder hitting pure electric type Pokemon that could abuse Dynamax much more readily. Despite all that though, Raikou still did manage to place well at the 2022 World Championships on Tatsuya Watanaki's team, who used it to activate Weakness Pulse and his Kyogre with Volt Switch. However, it has struggled to see any results whatsoever in Generation 9. Regieleki, on the other hand, was actually a solid Pokemon in its premier generation, no doubt, but its power in Dynamax formats led to Game Freak making an unprecedented decision. While Regieleki was capable of dealing massive damage whether Dynamaxed or not, its counterpart in Regidrago was notably lagging behind. It was by no means bad, but Game Freak saw fit to even the playing field once Generation 9 came around. Regieleki and Regidrago had counterpart abilities in Transistor and Dragon's Maw respectively. Both of these abilities would give a 50% increase to the attacking stat if the respective Pokemon was using an electric or dragon move. Due to its high speed, Regieleki was far more capable of getting attacks off and thus one-shotting even the likes of Zacian given Regieleki was holding a life orb. So in Gen 9, Game Freak decreased Regieleki's boost from Transistor from 1.5 times to 1.3 times. This was a shock to basically every competitive player as when Pokemon are counterparts, Game Freak tends to buff or nerf the group collectively. Take for example, Zacian and Zamazenta. Despite Zamazenta being a far weaker Pokemon than Zacian, Game Freak decided to nerf them both by having both of their abilities only activate once per battle. On top of that, Zamazenta received an equivalent nerf in base stat total compared to Zacian. This decision to nerf Regieleki without touching Regidrago not only led to Regidrago seeing far higher usage in tournaments, but it led to the downfall of Regieleki overall. What was once a strong pick that dominated tournaments soon became a niche option which so far has only had one notable tournament placement, taking second at the 2023 Latin America International Championships on Tiago Latanzi's team, but since then it struggled to see any usage whatsoever. Speaking of Pokemon with little to no usage, it's pretty much impossible to find any evidence that the Lake Trio have ever had any VGC viability. This entire group of Pokemon are having a mid-off as we speak. Not even a signature move that always raises their special attack stat could cause them to see any usage. It kind of feels like a sick joke, I mean these things are three of the four Pokemon that can learn Expanding Force by level up, but they don't even get the terrain boost on the move because they're all levitating. Why would Game Freak do this? Are they stupid? Azov's biggest role in competitive is blowing itself up, Yuxi is just Diet Cresselia, and Mesprit can't decide which one of its two disappointing older siblings it wants to be like. Look at these stats. How are you going to have 105 in every single stat except for the two where they matter most? It could have been faster than Landorus Incarnate and reliably take it out with Ice Beam. It would have been great if one of these disappointing three could reliably take on what is quite possibly the strongest legendary trio in history. Well, most of the three genies were at least. Tornadus is historically one of the best legendary Pokemon with access to Prankster, Tailwind, and incredible support moves like Taunt and Icy Wind. They even gave it a powerful, if risky, signature move in Bleak Wind Storm. Now, this move isn't just a 100 base power move that hits both opponents, but it can also result in a speed drop on the target leading to a more reliable follow-up from its partner. That or you could just give the King Gambit a defiant boost and lose the game instantly. But besides that, it's a pretty good Mon. Where it fails is its Therian form. The other two dudes got banger Therians with massive damage output or insane utility, and Tornadus got 
like fatter? While it may have a higher speed stat, it loses Prankster, so it ends up being outclassed by its base form anyways, since its tailwind is typically going to be shut down by opposing Tornadus anyways. It doesn't even hit as hard because its attack and special attack points got moved to its bulk, meaning what was once a super min-maxed viable Pokemon just sort of becomes worse overall. It does gain Regenerator, making it actually pretty great in singles, but we're talking about VGC here, so it doesn't really do anything. But I suppose things could be worse for Tornadus. Much like myself, all it has to do to avoid recognizing its mediocrity is just not look in the mirror. But a Pokemon that can't escape its mediocrity is Tapu Bulu, who walked so Rillaboom could run, or sprint, that Pokemon's insane. Tapu Bulu was once a very powerful metagame threat, and this was for a number of reasons, not the least of which was the combination of Grassy Surge and Woodhammer. And back in Generation 7, the trains were actually far stronger than they are now, where modern terrain is only a 30% increase in power, Back in Gen 6 and 7, the terrains enjoyed the same boost as Rain and Sun at 50%. Well, except for Misty Terrain, she's always been kind of quirky. But Tapu Bulu was a Pokemon capable of sustaining itself and its team with terrain recovery, while also dishing out major damage with its grass moves. All it was missing was Reliable Fairy Stab, other than Dazzling Gleam. It found itself on teams alongside the likes of Arcanine and Nihiligo in 2017, and Mega Gengar and Kamoa in 2018. But its moment has since passed because one of the Pokemon arriving in Generation 8 just simply outclassed it. Rillaboom not only had access to fake out in U-turn, allowing it to function as sort of a grass type Incineroar, but what was truly the nail in the coffin was the Isle of Armor DLC granting Rillaboom Grassy Glide, and at the time, 70 base power grass move, which gained priority if Grassy Terrain was active, which with Rillaboom on the field was basically all the time since it also had Grassy Surge. So in reality, Tapu Bulu never actually got any worse, it's just been permanently outclassed by Rillaboom. Rillaboom can do effectively everything Tapu Bulu can do and more, and it's just more reliable, its pure grass type means that it's not going to have any of those fairy weaknesses that Tapu Bulu would have. In fact, Tapu Bulu's fairy typing is more of a hindrance than anything since it doesn't have any access to good fairy moves. While Tapu Bulu got worse in Generation 8 all due to one Pokemon existing, we can actually say the opposite about Regigigas. Regigigas has historically been the poster child of weak legendary Pokemon. As a pure normal type with great coverage and frankly ridiculous stats, it would certainly be broken in VGC if it didn't have any sort of hindrance. This hindrance came in the form of its ability, Slow Start. This halves the attack and speed stat of Regigigas for the first five turns it's on the field, after which it would get its act together and the nerf would go away. Only issue is that this nerf would immediately return if Regigigas was ever switched out. Not to mention the fact that stalling five turns in VGC is really difficult when you're one of the few Pokemon without access to the move Protect, up until Generation 8 at least. But along with Protect, Regigigas also got a brand new best friend in Weezing. While Weezing wasn't a brand new Pokemon in Generation 8, it might as well have been since it got a new signature ability in Neutralizing Gas, changing the way it played entirely. This ability simply turns off all other abilities except for a select few. This single Pokemon led to Regigigas becoming one of the most feared VGC Pokemon in Generation 8. By running Giga Impact as its main attacking move, equipping a Life Orb, and Dynamaxing, Regigigas had the potential to crush the opposing team into the ground within just a few turns. The partner Weezing would run a set of Protect, Taunt, Will-O-Wisp, and Sludge Bomb, along with the Shookaberry to decrease damage from ground moves. It would also run a decent amount of speed, just enough to outspeed Pokemon like Tornadus after they got a speed drop. This is because neutralizing gas disabled Prankster, meaning that Weezing would be able to taunt the opposing Tornadus and prevent Tailwind from going off at all, allowing for Regigigas to make the most of its two remaining Dynamax turns to try to pick up a KO with its devastating Giga Impact or its coverage moves like Max Quake. Weezing single-handedly allowed for the most notoriously weak legendary Pokemon to become top tier for a generation. But not all poison types have this luxury of being strong. The Loyal Three were introduced in Gen 9's first DLC. While Okidogi, Monkey Dory, and Pheasantipity are all Pokemon with a fairly unique typing and sweet signature ability in Toxic Chain, only Okidogi was able to escape mediocrity, and only barely. Monkey Dory and Pheasantipity have been sort of forgotten, and this is pretty crazy considering the poison typing is more in demand than ever with Fluttermane's fairy moves being ever present in modern VGC. I mean, Pheasantipity is literally a bulky fairy poison type with a super deep support move pool, yet it hardly sees higher usage than Bruxish. Really, you can explain this phenomena by the fact that Pheasantipity's stats are just weird. It's got fairly good bulk and decent speed, but offensively, the best you're going to get out of this thing is the constant fishing for Toxic every time you click D-Gleam or Icy Wind. Off of that ab absolutely massive 70 special attack. Granted, you could try to use a physical set with its better 91 attack stat, but then you're getting less value out of Toxic Chain since you won't be able to hit both opponents each turn. Sure, you could try to use the ability of Technician to boost some of its weaker physical moves, but is it really worth it when the best you're going to get is a 75 base power Poison Tail? 
I don't really think so. If Fessendipity is questionable, Monkey Dory is straight up comedically bad. It has so much going for it, and yet it can't really accomplish anything. It's got 106 base speed, fake out, nasty plot, and a massive 130 special attack stat, but its damage output is just barely too low to get things done. It's slower than Chen Pao and Fluttermane, but it can't one-shot either of them. It's completely walled by Golden Go, and Incineroar is really just the nail in the coffin for it. This guy is just barely slow enough and weak enough to accomplish nothing game to game, but I suppose you could just blame its typing. I mean, typing can certainly drag even the best Pokemon down. Just take a look at all of the Ice-type legendaries. Articuno, Glacier, and Regice all fail to accomplish much in any game. Articuno has historically been one of the weakest legendaries due to its middling stats and its Ice Flying type, meaning it can't tank a Rock Slide for the life of it. Its special attack set is too low to KO some Assault Vest Landers despite the 4 times damage, and its speed stat isn't high enough to get Tailwinds off reliably. Gen 9 somewhat remedied this, but it left it more as a gimmick than anything. Terrestrialization allows for this thing to become a water type, making its defensive stats much more better in a context where it's not weak to literally everything. And its hidden ability Snow Cloak combined with Gen 9's rework of making Ice types defense boosted in snow makes it both bulky and difficult to hit in the first place. Equip this thing with a Bright Powder and start spamming blizzards to fish for freezes, and you'll start to see your opponents hold their heads in their hands, just hoping that the match will wrap up soon. Despite this, it really only had one notable Day 2 placement at the 2023 World Championships piloted by Patrick Donegan, but it was a really cool run. On the other side of things, Glacier went from being a fairly decent Ice-type legend in Generation 8 to being a mediocre pick in Gen 9. Its extremely min-max stats make it a very bulky, slow Trick Room Sweeper. With Dynamax in Generation 8, it was able to spam massively powerful Ice, Ground, and Steel-type max moves to boost its defensive stats, while also gaining an attack boost every time it scores a KO due to its ability Chilling Nay, meaning it can, pardon the pun, snowball pretty easily. While this Pokemon saw some notable success in Gen 8, Gen 9 has been far less friendly to it. It ended up not only dropping in usage in VGC, leaving little to no impact in the metagame, but it's also now PU in Smogon singles. This can be due to a number of reasons. Well, actually I'm lying. It has literally everything going for it except for its typing. I guess it doesn't matter how much you buff snow teams. Ice types are just fundamentally not going to work unless they're fast offensive Pokemon. So please, Game Freak, stop trying to make bulky I Good lord, what is that? Aurora Borealis? Regice is hilarious. Not only is it the only Reggie that isn't technically a Reggie, the I in its name is long, it's, but it's the only one of the Hoenn 3 that didn't instantly become viable by gaining body press. That's right, a move single-handedly saved two of these dudes. Reggie Rock? That's a 200 defense stat. Give that boy body press. Reggie Steel? That's a 150 defense stat. Give that boy body press. Regice? That's... Well, that's just 100. Maybe the snow buff can help it be a little bit... Eh, wait, no, it's only got 100 special attack stat, so Blizzard isn't going to be that strong either. Maybe this guy can wall a few things out in snow with a veil and ice body active, but why bother trying to make the bulky ice type any bulkier when it can't go on the offensive at all? You end up just having all the Pokemon next to it targeted until it's in a 1v4 situation. Yeah, Regice is just fundamentally non-functional. A bad typing on a bulky mon is never going to work. Please don't make me confront my demons here. Okay, so basically, this is the thousandth time I've said this on the channel, but I ran Wochen's stall at every regional it was legal at in the 2023 season, to the point where it kind of became a joke within the community that I was holding up tournaments, and I was really good at it. But man, man, this guy just doesn't work well. It's a specially bulky Pokemon with access to Snarl, Leech Seed, Foul Play, and an ability which decreases the attack stats of everything on the field, meaning its physical defense is also massive. If this thing has seeds up, leftovers and protect, it can easily win a 1v2, granted the right Pokemon are on the other side of the field. But that typing, Grass Dark isn't great for a bulky Pokemon. While Wo Chen can certainly function in Gen 9, it's what I like to refer to as a Terra Sync. If you're bringing it to a match, there's like a 98, maybe 99% chance you'll have to Terra it. Chien Pao, oh yeah, you better Terra it. Iron Hands, oh yeah, no, no, you need to Terra that. Flutter Mane, yep, yeah, you're gonna need to Terra that thing. There's like a list of Pokemon short enough to fit on one hand that Wo Chen doesn't need to Terra in front of. Its best partner is undoubtedly Glamora, since the toxic spikes in Mortal Spin allow for the opposing team to be easily stalled out, but Wo Chen's ability can also be a double-edged sword. The best Pokemon in the game tend to be physical attackers, from Urshifu to Iron Hands to Chen Pao, etc. And decreasing their damage output with this dude on the field can throw an entire game for you. Trust me, it's how I missed Day 2 at Charlotte Regionals last year. Point is, the snail sucks, but he's my special little guy. 
All right, let's knock these last three Pokemon out because I can't think of any more segues. And they have such low usage that it's legitimately hard to make any points in their viability other than them just not working well. We'll start with the funniest of the three being Guzzlord. Whoever at Game Freak thought introducing a bulky dark dragon type the same generation as four top tier fairies was one bold dude. It was practically impossible to avoid seeing a fairy type this gen. But do you know what was really easy to avoid seeing? The floor, because it always had terrain active from the fairies that were on every single team. Guzzlord is not only slow, but it doesn't hit particularly hard, and its, quote, bulk comes entirely from its HP. Those defenses are pitiful. Yeah, this, this dude, this dude, this dude. He's only got that many mouths because he needs that many to explain how much he sucks. Finally, we have Type Null in Sil Valley. Type Null we can kind of skip over because it's just a pre-evolution of Sil Valley. But yeah, it's really bulky in a pure normal type, but he's got no recovery and really poor damage output. You could put an Eviolite on him and it's really hard to KO, but he's he's still just kind of mid. Silvalli though is really funny, because we were meant to believe that within lore, this thing was an Ultra Beast destroying machine. But which one does it beat again? I guess that depends on the memory that you equip. These things' memories function similarly to Arceus's plates, thus its ability, RKS system. But not exactly. While the memories can change Silvalli's type and the type of its signature move, multi-attack, unlike the plates, it doesn't grant a boost to their respective types' moves. And so Valley certainly needed it. With 95 across the board, it simply just doesn't hit hard. And this was remedied in Generation 8, where multi-attack was buffed to be a massive 120 base power, the same as Double Edge. A buff nearly no one knows about because, surprise surprise, so Valley wasn't good in that gen either. It does have some sauce, don't get me wrong, it has Snarl in Parting Shot, so it used to be able to crash the game. Check out my Glitches and BGC video for further context on that, but that's about all it had going for it. Well, it could also explode. And yeah, those are all the legendary Pokemon who are just not very good. If you're looking for even more legendary Pokemon that aren't viable and competitive, I actually did make a video covering the restricted legends like Mewtwo and Giratina being bad and competitive, so you can check that video out now. Actually, I have tons of videos just like this in a playlist that I recommend you take a look at. I know there's content in there that you'll enjoy if you like this video. But before you go, be sure to leave a like and subscribe. I'm trying to hit 200,000 subscribers before the end of the year, and I would really appreciate the support. If you want to support me even further and get access to sneak peeks at upcoming videos early or see your name at the end of my videos like all these wonderful people, you can either become a YouTube channel member by clicking the join button or supporting me on Patreon. I'd like to give a special thank you to my most boosted supporters, Avatar67, Canor, Halo, Jordan Harridge, and Narwiz. Thank you so much for your generous pledges. With that though, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video. Bye!